today what I'm going to really try to uh, benefit you as much as possible, okay? And to bring some understanding. So in this three things I'm going to focus on, or maybe a little bit more than three, is first of all on inner peace and contentment. What is inner peace and contentment? Here I will use some of the quotes of some of the great philosophers, religious leaders, and also the Buddha. And then very much on the inner peace and contentment, I rely on the message of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. You got it? He's teaching on peace. I shall essentialize it for you in a very practical way. So I'm going to do it in a short time, So, but I mean, it's, it's, everything is there. You can take this and practice for whole life. Then another thing, I thought I might give you a essence of teaching of Buddha. What is the essence of teaching Buddha? And then I will come to the main thing is about understanding the mind and its true nature. And meditation may come a little bit with that. So it's quite a, a lot of things because I always try to bring something complete to you. So you might not be able to take everything in, but just merely hearing it may sow some seeds of awakening. I pray. So we begin. Regardless of who we are, the main purpose of our life, you could call it the heart of being human, is to be happy. All of us share the same wish, the same right to seek happiness and avoid suffering. But if you look closely, his own Dalama says, we can see there are two kinds of happiness. One is based more on physical comfort. You can say happiness, the pleasure, happiness of senses. But the other is founded on a deeper mental contentment. You can say the one is very expensive and often not very satisfying, but other the deeper mental contentment, if you find it, will really bring you deep satisfaction. As the great ancient Greek philosopher, Socrates, he said, contentment is natural wealth, luxury is artificial poverty. St. Paul tells us in the Bible, for I have learned in whatever state I am therein to be content. The prophet Muhammad said also, riches come not from an abundance of worldly goods, but from a contented mind. As Buddha said, contentment is the most excellent of all wealth. And the great Indian master, who's only second to Buddha, called Nagarjuna, he said, there is no treasure like contentment. Now, many people spend all their time and energy trying to accumulate and maintain material or outer wealth. This leaves them very little opportunity to cultivate the inner wealth, qualities such as compassion and patience. And this imbalance makes them particularly vulnerable and unable to cope with many of the challenges of life and the crisis. But if we have the deeper inner peace and contentment, this inner wealth, then even when we go through suffering, a mind can still be happy. This explains how there are some people who can have every material advantage and yet remain dissatisfied and discontent, while there are others who are always satisfied and content, 
even amidst the most difficult of circumstances. As the great saints of the past used to say, it is the foolish that go looking for happiness outside of themselves. Because once you go looking for happiness outside of yourself, you no longer have any control. But it is the wise and learned know all the happiness and the cause of happiness are present in our mind and in our heart. In fact, Dalai Lama says that the principal characteristic of genuine happiness is in a peace and contentment. So if you have contentment and inner peace as your basis, then your mind will be relaxed and at ease. Which means if you have contentment and inner peace as your basis, as your ground, then your mind will be relaxed and at ease. And if your mind is relaxed and at ease, then no matter what difficulties or crises you encounter, you will not be disturbed and your basic sense of well-being will not be undermined either. As a result, you'll be able to carry on your everyday life, your work and your responsibilities more efficiently and your mind will also have the wisdom to discern what to do and what not to do. In turn, your life will become happier and then when even difficulties come, you'll be able them to turn them to your advantage. So for your inner peace and stability, taking care of your mind and heart is crucial. Once your own mind is more at peace, then both inner and outer harmony will automatically follow. That's the essence of contentment and inner peace. Clear? Now, uh, if I were to share you the essence of teaching of Buddha, you see, actually teaching Buddha is very vast. What Buddha taught alone is 100 volumes. So Buddha's Bible is not just one book. 108 volumes and the work of the great Indian masters over 200. So the Buddha's Bible is about 300 volumes. But at the same time, the amazing thing is that it can be all essentialized. When Buddha was asked, what is the essence of his teachings? He said, commit not a single unwholesome action. That's first line. Second is cultivate a wealth of virtue. Third and most important thing is to tame this mind, to conquer, to transform this mind of ours. This is the teaching of Buddha. In fact, if you put it even more simply, in the Theravada, which is the Buddhism that's in practice in Sri Lanka, Thailand, Burma, and uh, some of the South Asian countries, there a simple translation, which means to do no evil and to do good, to keep your mind pure. This is the teaching of Buddha. But in Tibetan, it's a little bit more fuller, which says, Commit not a single unwholesome action. But then you might say, but how can I possibly not commit a single unwholesome action? What it really means, there's one thing is what's written in the scriptures, but the wonderful thing is when you really have a master. That's why in the Buddhist tradition generally, and especially in the Tibetan, is the master, the teacher, is the one who really makes it possible. Explained in a way gives the real meaning of what Buddha meant. So the real meaning when it's explained, from the time of Buddha, he actually showed what he meant in his teaching directly to his disciples, who then transmitted to his disciples, continue like that. Then there's a lineage of wisdom and compassion. You got it? And then there's no danger of fundamentalism or there's no danger of a kind of misinterpretation. That's why when the master explained in the scripture it said, commit not a single unwholesome action, but the teacher then when they're explaining what that means is, what it really means is as much as possible, abandon unwholesome, negative, and harmful actions of the body, speech, and mind, 
which are the cause of suffering for oneself and others. Basically means don't harm. In fact, the great Tibetan lamas will say, if you cannot help, at least don't harm. You understand? If you cannot help, at least don't harm. Don't keep malice and hatred in your heart. You got it? The most important thing is not keep malice and hatred in your heart. Keep your mind and heart pure. Also, when we die, two things count, which is how we've lived our life. I mean, I don't mean, you know, you live a good life drinking champagne and all that. I don't mean that. But live the good life of helping others. You understand? Helping others. And then also the state of your mind when you die. These two count a lot. So that's why most important is not to keep malice and hatred in your heart. Keep your mind and heart pure. That's why Dalai Lama in his earlier teachings, he would often say, my religion is very simple, my religion is kindness. He would always emphasize on the importance of good heart. You understand it? Good heart. In fact, that goes for the next line. Next line is cultivate the wealth of virtue, which means as much as possible adopt, on the other hand, all the positive, wholesome, and beneficial actions of the body, speech, mind, which are the cause of happiness for yourself and others. In fact, if you put it very simply, if you don't want suffering, then we must remove the cause of suffering. Buddhism very much is about cause and effect. And that the cause of suffering is ignorance, which bring about selfishness, and negative or destructive emotions and negative actions, which are the cause of suffering. You understand? In fact, interesting is when you actually harm others, actually you realize that actually one that you harm most is yourself. When you help others, one that you help most is yourself. Anyway, so go further. So on the other hand, if you want happiness, then you must develop knowledge and wisdom which are the antidote to ignorance, dispel the ignorance, the darkness of ignorance, and develop positive emotions such as love, compassion, joy, rejoicing instead of envy, and equanimity instead of bias and discrimination. So develop positive emotions and engage in wholesome beneficial actions which will be the cause of happiness for yourself and others. In fact, if you were to say about samsara and nirvana, samsara is because of ignorance, negative emotion and negative action results in samsara. Nirvana is led by accumulation of knowledge, wisdom, positive actions such as development of love, compassion and positive beneficial actions. Is that clear? So then you see, when you begin, when you start, Dalai Lama, whenever, you know, when you first start teaching, he always used to say, you see, of course we think of ourselves, what's good for ourselves, what's for our interest, you know. He used to think when you think like that, it's very important to think, don't be foolishly selfish, but be wisely selfish, or rather, put it this way, don't just be foolish when you think about what's good for you. Because sometimes we don't think, we don't really, really see what's good for us. So if you really look and see what's really good for you, which is, of course, you have the right to think about what's good for you. That, if you really think, is not selfish at all. You deserve it. When you do that, you realize that actually when you harm others, it harms you. In fact, when you help others, it helps you. You see, when you realize, first you just thought of yourself was what's good for you, what's not good for you. So you realize harming is not good for you. Helping is very good for you. 
So first you thought from only from yourself, your only enlightened self-interest. But then when you really start realizing that on a deeper level, my happiness and my suffering is connected with happiness, suffering of others. That we are all interconnected. We are all interdependent. This inspired non-harming and altruism, which slowly leads to compassion. Isurin Dalama often used to say, if you were to ask what is the fundamental Buddhist philosophy, okay? What is the fundamental Buddhist philosophy? I mean, philosophy, when you talk about philosophy, is when you don't practice, you call it philosophy. When we practice it, it's called the view. What is the fundamental Buddhist philosophy? The view is that everything is interdependent. Everything is interdependent. Everything is interdependent. Because things are interdependent, that things are impermanent. When you realize that inspires compassion. Anyway, so this Buddhist view, fundamental Buddhist philosophy view is everything is interdependent. And what is Buddhist conduct or practice is non-harming or non-violence. So first, his own Dalama often says, this Buddhist view of interdependence is not just a philosophy, it's something extremely useful in a life. Like, for example, if you get angry with somebody, really we start blaming the person, blaming, and the neurons in our brain like to gossip, you know, they say, oh, it's terrible, it's terrible. And you more and more you think, you more and more your anger grows. You understand? And you start blaming that person as being the person, the cause of. Because generally, you see, because of our own ego. Ego, by the way, there are two meanings to ego. Ego is a sense of self is okay, but sometimes when we're very selfish in a kind of a stubborn way, the tendency for us is whatever it goes well with us is our doing. Whatever goes wrong is often someone else's fault. Us as well, really. The great masters often say that's really true. We kind of think that we take credit for all the good things, bad things, we blame others. So we bl others and we get really angry and use that as a target of our anger. But that when you do that is actually we're not looking at the whole picture. We're just looking at only a particular, you know, cause or a, but if we really look from the Buddhist point of view of interdependence. There are many causes and conditions. Many causes and conditions. Things are not that simple. You understand? Many causes and conditions. If you really look very seriously, very fairly, if you look, there are many causes and conditions. This particular situation, event, came not only but because of this particular person. It might be that you yourself will be also responsible to a certain extent, but we don't like to think about that. We just blame others. But when you really come to reason and start reflecting on, you know, really trying to look at it from the bigger picture. Bigger picture is very important, by the way. It's very important not to be limited. Limited, not to be narrow. You understand? To be open. Openness is the greatest protection. Really, openness is a great protection. If you close your heart, it will hurt you and hurt others. You understand? Very much also, being kind of seeing small things, being petty, is what brings really trouble in the world. We must have all, have the larger picture. Really, we must try to, especially as younger people. You're the future of the world. And the times now are even more challenging than before. It's for us, therefore, to bring a change. Some say, some prophecies say, this year, 2012, in December the 21st, is going to be the end of the world. There was a movie about that also. 
But actually some say that the prophecy, if you look at it in a different way, it may indicate to a time of transformation, need for us to transform, bringing end to a particular way of thinking. We hope that is, and that can perhaps save the world. You understand? So very much, you see, we are all very powerful. We can effect change. Anyway, so when you look from a bigger point of view, you realize that you see, you yourself may be to be blamed. And this particular person is just a small part of the jigsaw puzzle. And then when you start realizing that, then your anger begins to diminish. You understand? And the reason return, sanity comes back. Otherwise, in a fit of anger, we become insane. As the great masters, and Dalai Lama often quote this, he says, do not sacrifice your long-term benefit with short-term pleasure. You always see the consequences of action. Be spontaneous, but also <laughs> see the consequences of the action. Consequences, you know. Yeah. Be wise. Be intelligent. So when you start seeing things from a bigger picture and you realize the interdependence of circumstance situations, then you see anger or the violence inside is diminishes. So bring about therefore non-harming, or the disarmament, inner disarmament. You understand? Very much. And so that will inspire naturally into non-harming. So on the other hand, of course, the very important thing is to really develop, as I said earlier, the most important, develop good heart. As the great Tibetan Lamas always say, if you cannot help, at least don't harm. Don't keep malice or hate in your heart. Instead, very much, develop good heart. There was a very great master in the 11th century. He came from India. He was a great, great master of compassion. Teaching on compassion, lineage of what's called Lojong training of the mind and compassion was he was the one of the forefathers, a great, great master. Dalai Lama follows very much his line. He used to always, whenever he greet people, and normally we say, how are you? How's your health? How's your family? How's your dog? How's your cat? In England you say, how's the weather? <laughs> always. But he always used to ask we never made me, he said, how's your good heart today? How's your good heart today? Because most important thing is good heart. And we all have it. And we must learn to develop that good heart. In our tradition, in the Buddhist tradition of Tibet, what we value most is not just intelligence or one's cleverness, but most of what we regard is good heart. Somebody is a good person. Somebody has really got good heart. Is someone you can rely on. But also in Buddhism, when you talk about compassion, compassion not just merely empathy, not just heart only, it's also reason. Has a very highly cognitive component. So it's both empathy and reason. It's like almost like a someone who is very well-meaning, kind, and you see, good person, along with somebody who is very practical and wise. If you put the two together, the combination is quite amazing. I think Nelson Mandela once said, good heart and good head are a very powerful uh, kind of combination, he said. So, most important is, is developing good heart or being kind. You understand? 
and also kind to yourself. Very important. And one thing I want to say about compassion, very simply. This is the, really, his own Dalam often says that, you know, whenever you just think of yourself, only yourself, only yourself, what happens? We get caught up in this claustrophobic self where you not only end up not being happy, but you start blaming others and shirking responsibility. Whereas on the other hand, if you start working for the benefit of others, it's amazing is that your own welfare is taken care of as a matter of course. That means when you start helping others, you know, your own welfare is taken care of as a matter of course. You feel much better. So therefore, helping others is the most, most wonderful thing for yourself. That's why the great Buddhist saint called Shantideva, great bodhisattva, master of compassion, whose revelation called Bodhicca Avatara, in English is the guide to the bodhisattva way of life, is really the guide and manual for compassion. Is what his only Dalama trained from young. And he often says, if anything I learned about compassion and about bodhicitta, which bodhicitta means the enlightened heart or mind, which is when compassion, when it developed to a greater level and with vision and courage, it, it becomes what is called bodhicitta. He says, if anything I've learned about compassion or bodhicitta, he says, I owe entirely to the work of this great master, Shantideva. So in this, this great master, you know, he said, in a very famous statement he made, says, all the happiness there is in this world comes from thinking of others. All the suffering there is in this world comes from thinking of oneself only. And then also, it's very important, that when you practice compassion, his Dalai I remember we had a meeting with all scientists. He's been very much interested in the science and really been working deeply with scientists to really be doing deep research into meditation. Now, what's been very exciting at the recent research, it's not so recent, but now 10 years or more, has been that those who've done training of the mind in meditation and compassion, and or those who've done like 10 to 20, uh, 40,000 hours of meditation, they saw that the parts of brain that form positive emotions are lit up and working. And parts of brain that actually form negative emotions are down or out of order. What is amazing is they discover that parts of brain that form positive emotions are not only lit up when they're practicing, but even they're not practicing. So that means there's a permanent damage on their brain. They're always happy. <laughs> well, this is exciting because as you know, the biggest suffering in the developed countries is mental suffering. So you see that this shows that if you do meditation and practice of compassion, training of the mind can actually bring about change. Because as you know, the depression is the second most deliberating illness in the West, in the world. So there's a really exciting thing that it can overcome. But now you can say about 10 to 40,000 hours, that I can't do. But then more recent research have shown that you practice like every day 20 minutes or so, or you practice train for about two months or so, that it does definitely bring change in your brain. It's actually very good for the heart. It improves also your immunity system. So when we were having one of the conference in Dharamsala, where he's going to Dalam resides, uh, he's uh, exiled uh, home, we were with a number of scientists, we were discussing about destructive emotions, about destructive emotions. By the way, interesting, it is said that people who say always, I, 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 me, 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 have more risk of heart attack. It's really interesting, watch out. <laughs> so at the end of that conference, when his own Dalam was asked to conclude, he said very movingly, he said, 
People think compassion is good for someone else and not for yourself. He says this is a mistaken view. By the way, many, many people think compassion is pity. Pity, you know? Pity? No, that's not right. In Buddhism, compassion really has a sense of sameness and respect for the person. It's not pity at all. It's not, not a contestation. You understand? So he said, to think that compassion is only good for the others, not for yourself, he said, that's a mistaken view. He said, from my little experience, he always says, quite humbly, he says, from my little experience, he said, when I practice compassion, it fills me, particularly when I practice altruism, it really brings confidence, brings security, connect me with myself, connect me with the others, Really, when you practice compassion, that how much others benefit, I do not know, he said. Maybe 50% perhaps, but the one who truly benefits, the 100% beneficiary of your practice of compassion is yourself. And then also love. Love and compassion, they go together. It's very important sometimes, I think, you know, it's very important to love yourself in a healthy way. We all deserve, we are all lovable. Buddha said, if you look all over the world, someone more worthy of your love than you, you will not find another. He said, he who loves himself or she who loves herself will not harm another. Because if you truly love yourself, then you will not harm others. Because when you don't have the love, you don't feel you're lovable, and you don't feel the love, and you don't love yourself in a good way, then you become the cause of harming others, you know? He who loves himself will not harm another. That's a very important one. Will not harm another. Is that clear? Very important for us to love ourselves. But loving ourselves is opposite of just cherishing yourself only and at the expense of others, you know? Because others we are same anyway. Like I remember when I first wrote the book, Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, there were many people, you know, I used to give seminars and talks about helping the dying and so and there were many people would come saying that, well, my father's dying or my mother's dying, but I know I do love them, but I cannot show my love because there's so much history of pain and suffering, you know, relations so blocked. I don't know how to love. Then I tell them, you see, the first Buddhist practice is very, very good is that. I tell them, instead of considering them as your father or mother, how about considering them as another you? Another you. You got it? Another you. Just like you, they don't want suffering. Just like you, they wish for happiness. After all, they're human. Trouble with us sometimes, we think only person is human is you. Other people are not really human beings. You don't take them really seriously. Only human being is you. If you start really reflecting on others being the same as you, you know, there's another you, then just as you cherish yourself, you suddenly realize, oh, they're also like me. They're the same as me. They wish for happiness, just as I. That's why I said at the beginning, remember I said, the purpose of life, you could call the heart of being human to be happy. All of us share the same wish, the same right to seek happiness and avoid suffering. When you do that, then begin to open your heart. So anyway, cherishing only yourself selfishly is negative. That's not love. Whereas loving yourself is very important. And one very simple practice of loving kindness, a very simple practice, is you see, you reflect. You go back to your childhood or maybe in, in, in your life, 
somewhere where somebody loved you, loved you for who you are, loved you in a way he has completely loved you, or not even completely, a little bit is also okay. You understand? Loved you, and you feel, particularly in your childhood, could be your mother, could be your father. If father and mother is a problem, then your grandfather, grandmother. Someone who loved you. And go back to the feeling of that love that you received and fill your heart with that love. And then instead feel gratitude to the person who loved you. You understand? To develop this in your mind, to bring this love. And then you realize that through this, when someone has loved you, then you realize that actually that you're lovable and that you've been loved when you reflect on that. And then slowly, then you include somebody who didn't love you that much. Then slowly, slowly, a stranger, you begin to extend that love that you feel because now you begin to feel the love, you begin to extend to others. You know? And finally, even people who you have difficulty with, you begin to share that love with them. You understand? It's a very important practice of loving kindness you begin with before you begin with the practice of compassion. What is really love? Love is wishing someone to be happy. In fact, compassion, he said, may all beings be free from suffering and the cause of suffering is compassion. May all beings have happiness and cause of happiness is love. Love is wishing someone to have happiness and cause of happiness. Compassion is you wish how to free someone from the suffering and cause of suffering. How I wish I could free them from the suffering. And say to yourself, I want to do it personally. In fact, there's a very interesting story during the time of Buddha. And there were a group of monks that Buddha sent into the forest to practice meditation. But this forest was filled with spirits. who were not peace with themselves. So the monks got really frightened and they came back to Buddha saying, you know, what to do? Buddha said, now you go back to them and I'll give you a method, a mantra to say. So what did Buddha told him? To say, in your mind when you go to the forest to all the spirits saying that may you be well may you be happy you understand may you be well may you be happy may you be well may you be happy so the monks went and just you know start saying may you be well may you be happy as they kept saying that really really they were also overcame fear and as, the, of course, the spirits are very sensitive, they sense that they've come with good intention. They've not come to harm, but rather they're wishing them well, and they're wishing them happiness. So they, in turn, came and became very friendly and aided them in their meditation. So that's why I think it's a very important thing is that you wish all these people, may you be well and may you be happy. In fact, today when I was driving around, you know, I always look at people, I always wish them, may they be well, may they be happy. And when I see someone suffering mentally, of course, good thing is to go and do whatever you can in action, but also it's good to really just pray. Sometimes prayers are very powerful. To really saying that, how I wish, may they be free of suffering, the cause of suffering. I invoke all the Buddhas and the great masters, their blessing to help people free them from suffering and the cause of suffering. You understand? Now, the third line is the most important. The entire teaching of Buddha is summed up to one statement by Buddha, which is to tame this mind of ours. 
Rang Samyuk. In Tibetan, Rang means self. Sem means mind or heart. By the way, Tibetan masters, when they say mind, they always touch the heart. Mind and heart are same. In, the, in this way we mean it. So to tame this mind of ours, to conquer, to subjugate, of course, you don't probably like the word subjugate or conquer, you know. So if you don't like the word tame, then maybe a more friendly word is transformed. Ah, okay. Transform. That's I can accept. <laughs> subjugate, hmm, I don't want to. It doesn't mean subjugate in a negative way. Tame doesn't mean a negative way. It's like when you have a hide, you know hide? This is a nomadic Tibetan expression. When you have a hide, you want to make into leather, they're quite tough. Actually, our character is a little bit tough, generally. Little tough we are, you know? Little tough, we are quite tough. We need to soften it. Like when you take a hide, you have to first into water, wash it. Then, like, knead it, massage it with butter, you know, like, different things. Then it becomes very, you know, like that our characters are a little tough, which you soften it, make it more pliable. Pliable. That's called taming. You got it? So, that the entire teaching of Buddha is summed up into the statement by Buddha to tame this mind of ours. Rang is him. Rang means oneself. Sem means mind or heart. Yons means thoroughly or completely. Ndul is to tame or subjugate. It says tame your mind. It doesn't say tame somebody else's mind. It means work with yourself. Mind your business. You know, in the uh, peace movement, there's a saying, think globally, but act locally. Also in Christianity, it says, charity begins at home. Work with yourself. Don't point finger at others. There's a Tibetan saying, you cannot see, even you have a yak. Yak is a big animal, you know. If you have a yak, in your eyes, you don't see. But even a little speck of dust, someone else's, we can see. That when we not see our faults, but we can easily point out faults of others. Also, Buddha and Jesus also don't judge others. Should not judge others. Should not really, you know. Who are we to judge anyway? Appearance are deceiving. So, Buddha said, to tame this mind of ours. In fact, Buddha said, all fear and anxiety come from an untamed mind. That's why Buddha said, only thing that you have to fear is your untamed mind. You know, President Roosevelt, during the depression said, only thing you have to fear is the fear itself. So Buddha said, all fear and anxiety come from your mind. Because really, sometimes we are fearful of things, but actually it comes to how our mind is. If you work with mind, sometimes when I'm worried, when I worry or when I have certain anxiety, Immediately, I transform it into a prayer, into meditation. I invoke the Buddhas. Whenever I'm worried, or you know, I immediately invoke the Buddhas. Because if you keep worrying, then you start thinking of the worst kind of scenarios, and you really bring you down. You understand? So, state when you start invoking the Buddhas, you're doing something very positive. You feel you're doing something, and actually. When you do make prayers, heartfelt prayers, it's an inner communication and communicating with Buddhas also. It does bring about a transformation, really. It's amazing. I have a really 100% you 
belief or trust or faith in that when you make really strong prayers, heartfelt prayers. In fact, many of the things I've accomplished in my life through prayer, and of course through action also. And also important is motivation. My motivation is always to bring understanding. Because you see, one thing in this world, all the troubles come from misunderstanding. Misunderstanding. You understand? Misunderstanding. Misunderstanding. Which is because of ignorance. You know, we see with the relationship, couples, misunderstanding. And then pride, jealousy, these get in the way. And you lose something much bigger than your pride. Because of pride, it's stupid. So very much, you see, misunderstanding. Whenever you have problem with people, you must always say to yourself, you know, really, there must be misunderstanding, or there must be really, I was really trying to understand, see, maybe I do not communicate well, maybe I didn't understand it well, you know, when you work with people, it's very important to really try to reestablish, to, you know, you understand? And so, all fear and anxiety come from the mind that is untamed. Because when you really overcome and tame your mind, you see, like through meditation, through compassion, through prayer and devotion, it's amazing when your mind is secure through prayer and, you know, through meditation, you find that even those things that you were fearful before slowly begin to, how do you say? You got it. And also, you see, you work with your mind, really. If you work with your mind, you can overcome anything and everything. So all fear and anxiety come from a mind that's untamed. So the only thing you fear is your untamed mind. It's a, such a powerful message. It means it's up to you. You can work with mind, transform the mind. That's why, you see, reason why Buddha said the most important thing is tame this mind of ours. His only Dalama more recently always says Buddhism is about transforming the mind. What is Buddhism? is fundamentally about transforming the mind. You got it? Transform. If you ask very simply, what is Buddhism? It's transforming the mind. Through meditation, through compassion, through prayer. In fact, one great master of the mind training, you know, mind training is a particular term, is when we work with our ordinary wild mind and slowly through both using intelligence, wisdom, and compassion, work with your mind to overcome your mind and to really train the mind, and then you begin to develop more compassion and love and compassion. That's called lojong, training the mind. One great master of the mind training once said, he said, one of the most marvelous qualities of the mind is that it can always be transformed. There's always hope. We can always transform our mind. It's never too late. In fact, as I was saying earlier, the most important thing what Buddha said is to tame this mind of ours. Why? Because the mind or the heart is the most important. We have three things. Body, speech, and mind. In Buddhist teaching, we call them three doors. Because through these three things, we do positive things or we do negative things. You got it? But the most important of that is the mind. Because body and speech are merely subservient to the mind. Mind or the heart is the boss. Hence, the motivation is the most important. Motivation. And it is said in the teachings is that the mind is the creator of happiness and the creator of suffering. It is said, mind is not only the creator of happiness and creator of suffering, 
mind is also the creator of samsara and mind is also the creator of nirvana. That is to say, if you work with mind, if you really come and understand the mind, its real nature, the essence of work with the mind, mind is the most wonderful thing. Whereas, you see, if you're not able to understand the mind or master your mind, but instead if you fall prey to all the destructive and negative emotions, you know, thoughts and negative emotions, if they take control of you, if you become the victim of that, then your mind is the, your worst enemy. It's your very nightmare. As the poet John Milton said in Paradise Lost, he said, mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell or hell of heaven. In fact, Shanti Deva, he said, heaven and hell are just states of mind. Buddha also said, we are what we think. All that we are rise with the thoughts. With the thoughts, we make the world. Speak or act with pure mind and happiness will follow. We are what we think. All that we are rise with the thoughts. With the thoughts, we make the world. Speak or act with impure mind and trouble will follow as the ox that draws the cart. Shakespeare also said in Hamlet, there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Our real mind is pure, like a crystal. Crystal, when you place it on the green cloth, it becomes green, yellow cloth, yellow, red cloth, red. Mind itself is pure. But whatever we think, it makes it you, you understand? I mean, you're young, you're intelligent, you're very savvy. You can pick up things quickly, you don't have to repeat it. You have to be savvy about wisdom. You understand? Just intelligent alone and being quick will not bring happiness and contentment. His own Dalama very much speaks of the importance of education of the heart, of the more important values. Education is to prepare us for life. These are all just for life. You see, these are life teachings, which are also useful at the moment of death. You understand? So very much is in mind, if you really know how to work with your mind, it's the most wonderful thing. If you know, then it could be your very nightmare. But trouble with us, you see, Remember it said also, mind is the creator of samsara and mind is the creator of nirvana. Samsara is the cycle of existence of birth and death catered by suffering and determined by harmful actions, harmful emotions are actions of the karma. Because samsara is, you see, because of ignorance, negative emotion, negative actions, then we kept being reborn again and again in this wheel of suffering. That's samsara. You understand? Life is not samsara. But the way we live, we make it samsara. Whereas in nirvana is literally the state beyond suffering and sorrow. It can be said to be the Buddha itself. And so, there's a very moving saying by this great master, Shantideva. I find this very, very inspiring, very moving. He said, Though longing to be happy, in their ignorance, they destroy their own well-being as if it were the worst enemy. Although they long to get rid of suffering, yet they rush headlong towards it. Poor beings. That's samsara. You want happiness, but you do everything in the process to bring suffering. You understand? Your aim and actions are completely contrary. So you don't get very good results. Well, this is a little bit deep, but why not? I share with you. Why not? Okay. It says, mind is the creator of samsara. Mind is the creator of nirvana. Isn't it? 
So then you might ask, okay, what kind of mind creates samsara? What kind of mind creates nirvana? You got it? Well, I told you some basic things. Because of ignorance, negative emotion, negative actions will create samsara, suffering. But if you have wisdom, then develop positive emotions, love and compassion, and engage in wholesome, beneficial actions, that will be the cause of our being nirvana or peace. But more direct in terms of meditation, in terms of the highest meditation, nature, mind, the great masters say, samsara is mind turned outwardly lost in projection. That means nirvana is mind turned inwardly recognizing two nature, meaning Samsara is mind turned outwardly, lost in all the stories and projections and stories, going further and further from ourselves. Whereas nirvana is mind turned inwardly, recognizing its true nature. But now, here what we have to explain to you, very important thing is that normally whenever we think of the mind, we think of mind as what? Just thoughts and emotions. Even someone asked here, is there reality beyond thinking? Yes. Is that you see, normally what we think of mind is we think of just, when you say mind, what is mind? Thoughts, emotions, we think that's the mind. But actually, the teachings show us that thought and emotions are only one aspect of mind. It's only its outer appearance, how it appears. Like the sun's rays, but not the mind itself, not the sun itself. That's what teachings show there are two. There's the appearance aspect of mind, which is thoughts and emotions, and there is the essence and nature of mind. So the samsara is when you're just lost in thoughts, emotions, stories, without really understanding the mind itself, just lost in thought, emotion, stories, then it just simply kind of perpetuates. It's a bit like a soap opera. You know soap opera? Especially Mexican ones are there, very good Mexicans or South American ones. It seems it's about four characters obsessing about the same thing for 20 years. <laughs> That's sometimes how we are. Same thing, same thing. And always projections, always judging others, you know, really not taking care of our own mind. That's samsara. That's where it takes us further and further away from yourself. There's a very famous saying by a great master called Patrambas. He said, it's like keeping the elephant at home, but looking for its footprints in the forest. Yeah. Because the main thing is what we have to do. This is the secret. Secret is, main thing is to understand the mind itself. If you come to understand the mind itself, then there you find the peace and contentment. You got it? So that's why... Samsara is mind turned out and lost in thoughts, emotions, stories. Whereas nirvana is, is mind turned inwardly, is when you bring your mind home, where it truly belongs, and allow your mind to quietly settle in a state of calm abiding, in the state of natural great peace, allowing your mind to settle in its own nature, in a state of peace, which is the first meditation in Buddhism called Shamatha or in Tibetan Shine, calm abiding. Then from out of calm abiding, when the mind settles in this, you know, then comes the clear seeing of Vipassana. The inside the wisdom begins to come. The first all your thoughts the most settle in the state of calm abiding. Then out of that that the wisdom of your own insight or begins to dawn in a sense that the mind settles and then ego a little bit dissolves. And then what 
realize what is then dawn is the wisdom of egolessness, basically. So very much, you see, allow your mind to just quietly settle. In fact, there's a wonderful saying by the great masters, you see. I find this very useful. When I heard this about 40 years ago, it was a really a revelation for me. And he said, in Tibetan, it's very beautiful. He says, Chu manyuk na tang sem machina de. Which means, Chu means water in Tibetan. Manyuk means if you don't stir it. Na means then. Tang means clear. Water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. That's the nature of water. Dalai Lama will say, it's a fact. Water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. Isn't it? That's the nature of water. In the same manner, the nature of mind is such. Sem machina de. Is mind, machu is the most beautiful Tibetan word. Machu or machupa. Machupa means when you leave it completely unaltered. Unaltered means when you leave your mind naturally in its own nature, without any fabrication, without any manipulation, without any contrivance. Because trouble with us, the root cause of all our mental suffering, as one great authority to mental health says, is because of too much thinking, which stinks. Too much thinking, stinking. So the secret is mind, just as water, if you don't stir it, will become clear in the same manner if you leave your mind unaltered, unaltered means when you leave your mind in its own nature, very spaciously in its own nature, without any alteration, without altering, without changing, without contriving fabric, you just naturally, if you leave your mind, just quietly, you see, just like this, quietly. Just as water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. In the same manner, mind left unaltered will find true peace, will find true nature. It will bring about the calm abiding of shamatha, will bring about the clear seeing vipassana, and ultimately bring the nature of mind. And most important, it brings the inner peace and the contentment. Because the main problem is we are always doing, we are always speaking, we are always thinking. We've lost the sense of being. We don't know how to be. In fact, a French philosopher, Pascal, once said, all of men's difficulties come from his inability to sit quietly in a room by himself. We cannot just be. So if you can just allow, just as water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. Mind left unaltered will find true nature. So if you allow yourself, just quietly settle. And when you do that, if little thoughts come and go, doesn't matter. Even if you're not calm, also it's fine. Don't even try to be calm. Just be spacious. Most importantly, be spacious. And all of yourself, just quietly be. Be with yourself. When you're like that, 
what happens when you do more and more, you settle. It's like you come back to yourself. You come in touch with yourself. In touch with your others. You be in touch with your own heart, your mind also. You understand? From there comes the inner peace. Really the contentment. When we particularly come in touch with our more the essence of mind, the nature of mind, which is the most important Buddhism is nature of mind. In the Tibetan Book of Living Land, chapter 4, nature of mind, the most important is the nature of mind. That's why when we must say, samsara's mind turned out lost in projection, nirvana's mind turned inwardly wrecked in the nature, is really to come to realize the nature of mind, the really the essence of mind, to come to touch with your real true nature or true self. Someone said, you know, what is our true self? Our true self is when we are able to finish with all the rubbish and allow our all thoughts and emotions to quietly settle in a state of calm abiding. And then there comes the clear seeing in which you connect with your really fundamental nature beyond the ego. When that happens, you know, you know, you can see things, hear things, but there's less grasping enter into perception. As the, there's less grasping is an indication of your ego is slowly evaporating or the wisdom that realize egolessness is beginning to dawn. You understand? And then when you're in more touch with yourself, really, then all the conflicts within yourself actually dissolve. You make friends with yourself. The harm in you is dissolved. You also begin to forgive yourself and begin to in touch with yourself, begin to bring love in yourself. And then from out of this love comes also like, a, you know, you being also a good heart, kindness begin to generate to others and compassion begin to exude. And then as you begin to practice that way, gradually you realize, you see, thoughts are not just us, by the way. When you go beyond, slowly you begin to realize is actually thoughts are not you. Emotions are not you. In fact, often we think, this is a mistake, we think. When you have a good thought, you think you're good. When you think bad thought, you're bad. Then you go yo-yo. But actually, what the teachings show, and Buddhism, the fundamental thing is that we all have Buddha nature. We all have the potential of enlightenment. That, if I were to compare to, is like sky. You know, sky, when you see a sky that's completely free of clouds, that's like our true nature. You understand? Whereas clouds are like ordinary mind with thoughts, emotions, so on. Like, for example, when you take a plane and go beyond the clouds, then you really realize, if you go really, really higher, you begin to see there's an infinite space, sky, that's never, ever touched by the clouds. You know, clouds are only on the surface. They don't, I remember my master, Tingu Kentrum, which you say, they depend on sky non-dependently. They ridiculously hang there. Thoughts are not really us. They're just simply manifestation of my mind, but not really us. You understand? When you realize thoughts are not us, emotions are not us, there's an aspect of us which is beyond thoughts and emotions, like the sky itself. But then you're no longer afraid of your thoughts and emotions. You begin to realize we are bigger than our thoughts and emotions. Just as space is not defined by the object that moves through it, we are not defined by our thoughts and emotions. We are much bigger than thoughts and emotions. The most important thing for our return to that fundamental goodness, that skylark nature of mind, to return to that. That's why slowly through water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. 
mind left unaltered will find peace and well-being. Slowly through that, you begin to connect with the deeper dimension of your being, the skylark nature mind within yourself. As you connect with this, then you, you conquer all your thoughts and emotions in a deeper way. And you begin to see the illusory nature of all things. You begin to have the inner humor. That even though you may see the complexity of the world, but you have a carefree dignity which you can face the complexity with, with dignity, with humor, with composure. <laughs>